have I would like people to pray for Gordon Ferguson. He's in the hospital. Uh, it'll be his 12th day today. He's got uh, something wrong with his uh, intestines. And uh, he hasn't been able to eat for 10 days. So he's oh. on juice and, you know, all the stuff they pump through your arm. Yep. This is the second time he's been. And he thought he had a heart attack about a month ago that proved to be uh, no cancer, which is good. But uh, now he's in there with this, uh, some kind of stomach intestinal thing. Okay. Rex, is uh, Pat recovering? Was, how is she? She's here. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Pat. Hi. Yeah, hello, Pat. Yeah. Hope no. you're feeling better. I was say she's amongst the trees. <laughs> she's sneaking in and out. She's Robin Hood. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to begin tonight. Uh, let's. Uh, Let's begin with a word of prayer tonight. Pray for these that we've mentioned. <laughs> Father, thank you for uh, the privilege, Lord, to uh, come together on this midweek, a beautiful day, Lord. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the beautiful day we had, for the sunshine. Uh, and Father, we're encouraged to, to be together tonight, to study your word, uh, to encourage one another. Uh, Father, thank you for that uh, for that blessing. And Father, our, our hearts tonight are with uh, uh, Don Malore's friend and uh, his friend JJ, who uh, is struggling. Lord needs the encouragement. Needs to be uh, uh, needs to be built up. Lord uh, in life, uh, strengthen him. Father, uh, we pray for Don's friend that he can. He can be the mentor and the encourager and uh, father reach out to JJ and help him through this, uh, this time of hardship and sorrow that he's suffering. Uh, strengthen him, Lord. Uh, father, we pray for Preston as he is in the hospital uh, dealing with infection and pain. Uh, we pray for his recovery, Lord, and uh, we, uh, we pray that Preston can uh, recover and we miss him in our classes and in our uh, worship, our Father. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Gordon uh, tonight as he is in the hospital with intestinal issues. Uh, uh, Father, pray for, we pray for the doctors that are tending to him, that they can help him and that Gordon can recover. Uh, and Father, we pray for uh, those that are have struggled with uh, surgery and and physical ailments these past weeks. We pray for Nancy Armetta and her recovery, uh, for Kevin English as he recovers from the heart attack he suffered. Uh, we pray for Pat and her continued recovery from shingles. Uh, we pray for Ida, Father, as she continues to recover from the blood pressure issues she was struggling with. Uh, strengthen us, Father, physically. And Father, we pray for spiritual strength, that you'll help us and strengthen us in our battle with Satan and in some of the, some of the spiritual hardships that we face in life as well, Lord. Thank you for your love. We're grateful for this study in Romans tonight. Father, bless us in, the, in that study and uh, be with us through this evening. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, it's nice to see all your smiling faces. We had something to smile about today, didn't we? I, I think that all of us would, if asked, what is your favorite chapter in the New Testament? that without a doubt, Romans 8 would, would get a lot of mentions. Mm -hmm. It is certainly 
the high point of Paul's letter to the Romans. And if I were to give a title to this chapter, I would call it the blessings of being in Christ. Romans 8 is a conclusion to what Paul has taught in the first seven chapters. And Paul's heart cry in chapter 7, verse 24, who will rescue me from this body of death, was immediately answered in brief with a thanks be to God, because he was the one who rescued Paul. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 7, verse 25a. Now, the main concern of this question and its answer is freedom from the power and of indwelling sin. We may need to be reminded again of the main point that was established in chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, verse 21, that the penalty for our sins has been paid in full by Jesus. In the midst of our intense spiritual struggle against sin, in which we sometimes are on the losing end, we need not fear that our forgiveness is in jeopardy. Jesus has already secured this for us on the cross. The first key word in Romans 8, verse 1, is therefore. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore links what Paul is about to say to all that he has said before. It's the conclusion based upon the former information. The second key word is now. If Jesus had not come, all those Old Testament worthies would have lived and died without any real hope. But Jesus Christ has come and is a present reality. Because he's come, Paul speaks of the now. This now reaches back to those who lived in the Old Testament periods and reaches forward to all of us. The third key word is no condemnation. Paul says to those Roman Christians, there is therefore now no condemnation. Previously, they were condemned because of sin. Jesus has come, so there is therefore now no condemnation. So here is the importance of the issue. In John 3.17, Jesus said, God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him should be saved. Then he added, he that believes on the son is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Jesus is saying that man is on death row. Man is condemned because he's a sinner. He doesn't need to wait until judgment day for condemnation. Jesus says he's condemned already. The answer for us now is Christ. He who believes on the Son is not condemned. And we need to consider the Bible definition of faith. Remember Paul's illustration of Abraham? Trusting obedience is faith. People who have a trusting, obedient faith are not condemned. And that's the reason Paul says there is therefore now no condemnation. But we have a choice to make. The Savior of the world has come, but the world is not saved because it does not believe. And that's the reason it's essential that the message of Christ be preached to the world. Men must be allowed to have a basis on which to make a decision. When we hear the gospel, we're called on to make a choice. 
that choice is the choice of life or death, the choice between salvation and condemnation. Even though we have sinned, he says that we are no longer on death row when we have faith in Jesus. The next key in Romans 8 verse 1 is the phrase for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation in Christ. Out of Christ is condemnation. Imagine, if you will, a circle that represents Christ. Romans 8 1 teaches us that those who are in Christ are in that circle. Before we entered Christ, we were outside the circle. It's like a room that's entered through a doorway. When we are outside the door, well, obviously we're outside the room. There's a doorway into Christ. Until we enter the door, we're on the outside, we are condemned. God tells us how to get into Christ. The answer God gives us is in Romans 6, 3, which says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now, I don't know any other way to enter Christ than God's way. That little word into is a very important word. When we go through the door of biblical baptism, we enter into the room, into Christ. And the next verse in Romans 6, 4, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So why do people resist the, this biblical answer? Here's a simple, beautiful act of obedience. It pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It pictures our death to sin and our resurrection into Christ. But sometimes people say, well, if I enter into Christ through an act of obedience, that makes it of works. And the Bible says, not of works, lest any man should boast. And somebody else says, if I entered into Christ by an act of obedience, then I'm earning salvation. Now, those thoughts come from man's theology. They did not come from the Bible. Where did God ever say that your act of obedience is earning anything? No person can work his way to God through meritorious actions. Can we be saved and be in rebellion against God? Remember that faith is trusting obedience. When we obey God, we're not earning anything. When we obey God, we're just accepting what God is offering. So why do people resist this answer? Well, I wonder if it isn't Satan trying to keep us from doing God's will. No one wants us to be lost except Satan. God wants us to be saved. And we can only be saved in Christ. And Paul says we're baptized into Christ. What a blessing it is to be in Christ. And Paul adds in Romans 8 verse 6, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We must not be dominated by sinful nature. Later in this chapter, Paul says, for the mind set on the flesh is death. If we walk after the flesh, we will die. And such a life breaks our relationship with God. So we must be in tune with God's will. We must walk after the spirit. And God will help us to dominate the lower nature. Yes, we'll still be imperfect. There's a vast difference in the one who lives as he pleases and the one who lives as God pleases. But on occasion, that person who tries to live as God pleases does that which is wrong. The Christian sins, but sinning is not his lifestyle. When we sin, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us, 1 John 1, verse 7. 
we make the choice to want to overcome the flesh. And when we make that choice, God will help us. In chapter 8, verse 13, he says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. God helps us by his Spirit to overcome the flesh, to hold the flesh in check. Can we know which when we're whether we're dominated by the flesh or the spirit well it's not all that difficult to determine where do our interests lie where do we give our best effort our best effort must be given to god everything else must be sub subordinate to his will so we must make the choice to be in christ but somebody says, I can't make it. I can't, I can't choose. Well, yes, you can. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can choose. And God says, let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. We face our most vital issue of life. Have you chosen to be in Christ? And Paul says, if you have, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now, the next, next part of our lesson is taken from verses 14 through 17 of Romans 8. And to begin that, we, we might say that everyone in one sense, is a child of God. The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 17, we are all the offspring of God. So in that sense, we are all the children of God. But in another very special sense, God has chosen a group of people who are his obedient children. What a blessing that is. Paul began by showing us that when we're in Christ, we're no longer under condemnation. Before we come into Christ, we're lost and we're under the condemnation of God. The Christian has come out of the world and into Christ and is no longer under the sentence of eternal destruction. The second blessing of being in Christ is that we are children of God in a very significant way. And notice what Paul says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So the first important point that Paul makes here is this, the sons of God are led by the Spirit. Speaking, of course, of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Those who are the children of God are led by the Spirit. But what does that mean? Well, when we ask biblical questions, we need to seek biblical answers. During the ministry of Jesus, as recorded in John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Nobody comes unless God draws them. But everyone who is drawn has heard and learned of the Father, John 6, 44 through 46. And that's an important passage in regard to what Paul says about being led by the Spirit in Romans 8. Everyone who is drawn of God must come into contact with the message of God, the gospel. When we hear the gospel and we respond to the gospel in God's way, we're drawn to God. This is the way the Holy Spirit 
leads the sinner to salvation in Christ. The Holy Spirit does not answer, announce by a vision or a dream or some better felt than told experience that the Father has now made that sinner one of his children. That did not happen in the New Testament and it does not happen today. If we're led by the Spirit, we must hear the message of the Spirit. And the message of the Spirit is the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul said, which things also we speak, not words that man's wisdom teaches, but in the words that the Holy Spirit teaches. The apostle was affirming that what he preached and wrote for God was given by the words of the Holy Spirit. Do we believe this to be true? In the first century, preachers shared the message of God with sinners. In the first century, that message was confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Those men selected by God were guided by the Holy Spirit in writing down that message. Their message we now have in the New Testament. If we are to learn of God, we must learn the message that these men spoke and wrote down in the first century. Today, that message is in an inspired book. So this is the way the Holy Spirit leads us from out of Christ into Christ. The method of the Spirit has not changed since the first century. Between the Holy Spirit and the sinner, there was always a messenger. When we look at the growth of the early church as it unfolds in the book of Acts, we find about seven major cases of conversion. Eight stories of how people came out of the world into Christ. In each of these stories, there was always a human messenger who came to the sinner. That human messenger came with the word of God, the message of the spirit. When people learned from those messages what they needed to do to be saved, they were learning the spirit's message and they were being led by the spirit. So we must come to know the message that is in the New Testament. We either must be taught by someone or we must learn it for ourselves through personal study. The point is this, between the Holy Spirit and the sinner, there is the inspired message. The Holy Spirit does not come directly into the heart of the sinner. He does not come directly to the lost man to announce him how to be saved or to tell him that he is saved. If you want to know how to be saved, you need to know, believe, and obey the gospel. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus instructed John to write letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. At the conclusion of each of those letters, there are the important words, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Jesus instructed John to write. John wrote. The message that John wrote was sent to the churches. John wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Lord says, let those churches hear what the Spirit says to the churches. John wrote what was the Spirit's message. It was as though the Spirit himself were speaking to those churches. Now, in Romans 8, 14, it says the children of God are those who are led by the Spirit. The children of God are those who hear the message and respond to that message. It's the Spirit's message. We accept it if we're being led by the Spirit. Jesus said, they shall all be taught of God. And every man, therefore, who has heard and learn to the Father comes unto me. If there is no teaching, no hearing, no learning, there's no coming. Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
they are the sons of God. If you would be a child of God, you must come to the scriptures, hear what the Spirit has to say, and accept the message from the Spirit. Another point is made by Paul in verse 15. He shows that because we are sons of God, we have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. He says, we're not under bondage and fear. We're not like slaves, but are God's children. Before we became Christians, we were in bondage to sin. And in John 8, 32 through 34, Jesus said, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The person who is not in Christ lives under bondage and has every reason to be afraid. They're under condemnation, alienated from God. In Christ, they're no longer condemned. In Christ, they are a child of God. Their response to God is not like bond slaves. When we became Christians, we became servants of Jesus Christ. But we do not serve simply out of fear as a slave would serve. We do not serve Christ because we have to. We serve him because we get to. It's a privilege to be a child of God. The bond servant who serves out of fear is always asking the wrong questions. The person who serves God out of fear as a bond slave will ask, do I have to go to church? Or do I have to partake of the Lord's Supper? Or do I have to give a certain percent of my income back to God? Now, those are the wrong questions. The child of God is the one who wants to meet with other children of God in worship. He does not come to the place of worship as a slave, but as a true child of God. And he does not ask, do I have to partake of the supper? He gets to. He does not ask, do I have to give a certain amount? He gets to. There's a difference in attitude. As a child of God, we want to do everything we can to the glory of God. Jesus used the motivation of fear to encourage people to respond to him. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught more about hell than anybody else in the New Testament. If we will not respond to Christ except out of fear, well, let's respond out of fear. I believe that we can make our initial response to Christ because we're afraid of the consequence. But I do not believe that the growing Christian can serve Christ all of their life simply because of fear. We need to come to the place that we serve Christ because of joy. It is not a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, Paul says, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Abba, Father. God is our Father. He has adopted us into his family. And now our attitude is this, I want to do all that I can to his glory. At verse 16, Paul says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I want you to notice particularly this. Paul did not say that the spirit bears witness to our spirit. Some translations notwithstanding. Rather, he said, the spirit bears witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit has revealed in the New Testament how to be a child of God. When we do what the Spirit asks us to do, we become a child of God. We have the Spirit's message showing us how to be a child of God. We also have our own Spirit saying we have obeyed the Spirit's message. In every case of conversion in the book of Acts, it's apparent that the people heard the gospel. The Spirit's word says, hear the gospel. If you heard the gospel, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you've heard. 
in the cases of conversion in Acts, it's evident that they believed the message. And how did they know to believe the message, except that the message asked them to believe? So the spirit, if you have believed, the spirit bears witness with your spirit that you have believed. In Acts, people repented of their sins. How do they know to repent, except that the spirit revealed it? Have you repented? When you repent, the spirit bears witness with your spirit that you've repented. In every one of these stories of conversion in Acts, people were immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says be baptized. If you've been baptized biblically, the spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. The witness of the spirit is a clear, concise message. When you're in harmony with that message, the spirit bears witness with your spirit. The final word is this. If we're children of God, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. God has a wonderful inheritance for every one of his children. That's what it means to be in Christ. We can know if we're in, we are a child of God by following the simple precepts of his holy word. Well, I uh, wonder, <clears throat> There's some special things in these verses that we might want to talk about. One is um, where the Spirit said uh, we we called on on God as Abba, Father, and this is an indication of our assurance that we're truly his children by referring to God in the Aramaic Abba followed by the Greek for father we bear witness both to God and to man that we're sons and daughters of God doing so by the spirit reflects the spirit's role in empowering us to live the kind of life expected of a member of God's family and enabling us to do so in the spirit of sons and not slaves. In this way, the spirit empowers us to declare our sonship and to claim all the rights and privileges related to it. The spirit's role is not to add contact or content to our knowledge but to strengthen our wills. And the reference to adoption uh, is important. It distinguishes our sonship from the unique sonship of Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God. But it does not suggest that ours a mere pseudo sonship. In the Greek and Roman cultures of Paul's day, those adopted into a family became sons in every sense of the word. And they possessed the same rights as natural sons, especially with regard to inheritance. In fact, one of the main reasons for adopting a son was to appoint an heir for an otherwise sonless father. Now, of course, God is not some sonless, and he doesn't need more heirs in the normal sense of the word, but he wants to add as many as possible to his family so that he can share his unlimited estate with them as an earthly father bestows his goods on his children through his will. And so as the spirit of adoption, adoption, the Holy Spirit doesn't cause the adoption and make us sons of God. Again, his coming into our lives marks us as sons of God by 
engendering us with the attitude of sons rather than slaves. A main point in Romans, especially in chapter 3, verse 21 through 521, is that assurance of salvation is not only possible, but is the expected result of a right objective understanding of grace and what it means to be justified by faith in the atoning blood of Christ. You might remember that sequence of much more theme in chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. In addition, through his sanctifying power, it affects both our outward lives, verse 14, and our inward consciousness, 8, 15. The Spirit has given us a reason to cry, Abba, Father, and by him, that is, this, by the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And cry is a term that's used for a sincere and urgent prayer and for heartfelt praise to God. Here, it indicates a deeply felt and emotional acknowledgement of our sonship poured forth from the heart as a positive counterpart for the mournful cry of 724. The word Abba, since it's Aramaic, which was a Hebrew-like language spoken by Jews in New Testament times, Abba was the intimate term used by a child to address his male parent in New Testament times. But, and it's similar to Dada or daddy in English. By the time of Jesus, it wasn't limited to the speech of children, but it was still a term of intimacy and endearment, not one that Jews would even presume to use in addressing God. But Jesus used it in Mark 14, 36. And Paul used it in Romans 8, 15 and Galatians 4, 6. So it's apparent that Christians were taught to do the same in imitation of their Lord. Use of this term Abba in addressing God has uh, several implications. First of all, it's a family word expressive of family, famili familiarity, and in intimacy. When we use it, we're acknowledging that God is our father and we're his children. And second, it indicates that our relationship to the father is one of closeness, tenderness, and childlike confidence. It shows that God is not distant and alien from his children. It expresses our family solidarity with Christ since our Abba is his Abba. In all three New Testament passages where the term is used, the full expression is followed by the Greek equivalent. And perhaps this was to mark, make the meaning clear to those who didn't speak Aramaic. Well, I'm, I'm gonna pause there and see everybody can unmute. And if you have some comments you want to add, or questions, I don't propose to know all the answers. I'm I'm learning a lot out of Romans. Just I hope you are, but uh, I'll do my best. If I don't know the answer, I'll find it out. I really appreciate this um, definition of Abba because I didn't have that kind of representation in my earthly family. Yeah. My dad was very closed in a lot of ways. 
and which has made it difficult in my relationship with God, but this helps me, I guess, pull down a wall. Yeah. I think that uh, some have made the mistake of treating Abba as a common term that mm -hmm. just anybody can use with God. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely not true. Familiarity is one thing. Mm -hmm. Reverence and respect, intimacy is another. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And the adoption is something that is extra special too, because it, by the way that it was used in the Roman times and, and Greek times during New Testament times, it meant that you actually were a real died in the wool member of that family. Mm -hmm. And you had a, the same rights as all the other children. whether natural born uh, by both by your parents or whether adopted, there was literally no difference in standing. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really what it means for us to be called joint heirs with Christ. Hmm. He wants us to share in his glory. Mm -hmm. Now that glory obviously is, is promised to us, but of course we don't have it now, but it's promised to us. It's just like his money in the bank. And I, I kind of look back to the Old Testament with the relation that Moses had to Pharaoh he obviously was not a blood child, and yet in Pharaoh's mind, he was. He was accepted him like that yeah. until it came time that Moses severed that relationship. If yeah. we compare that to today, we, are, we have severed any relationship we had with Satan and put our relationship to God as our blood family. That's, and that, in essence, we then become the heir. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Great example. That's a really, mm -hmm. a really good example, Jess. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's very possible that Moses was in line to become the next Pharaoh. So God made a good choice there, didn't he? There's a lot of God, God, God made the choice, but Pharaoh, yeah. or I mean, Moses made the choice also. Yes, he did. And that's where we are. We have to make that choice of deciding what relationship we're going to have, what it means yeah. to us, what we're willing to sacrifice for it. Mm -hmm. Moses sacrificed all that wealth and power and prestige to be where he knew he needed to be. Yeah. And what a lesson that teaches us about the parents of Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's where he had to learn it. Well, he he learned, and, learned it from his own mother, you know. She, mm -hmm. she took care of him. I but uh, I think because Moses had his, had the plan of God in his mind mm -hmm. and uh, God worked with him that way and the, um, the things that were material to the world at that time were not in, didn't mean anything to him. He was more worried about his people. And I think about the providence of God as well, right there, when Moses um, decided that he wanted to um, go out and, and, and know his people. And uh, 
they were not ready to accept him, somehow or other, Moses felt like that they should know that he was to be their leader. But uh, God didn't want him to hang around there under the Pharaohs and have that influence on and see him rejected mm -hmm. all of those years. So just coincidentally, he happened to see two Hebrews fighting. And coincidentally, he happened to see um, the Egyptian slave master fighting with the Hebrew and kill that guy and then had to flee to the land of Midian. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of that happened coinc as a coincidence. No. Mm -hmm. I think God had all already right. knew uh, this was going to happen. Right. And, and, and he let it happen. Yeah. He was teaching him, leading him. Yeah. And one of the amazing things about Moses is you remember when uh, Miriam and Aaron started complaining about Moses? Well, well, is he the only that's only one that speaks for God? We speak for God too. And God called him on the carpet. <laughs> he told Moses, I'm going to go to the tent of meeting and you call Aaron and Miriam. I want to talk to him. And what did he tell Aaron and Miriam? I speak with Moses face to face. I speak in plain language to him. It's not that way with either one of you. So how dare you complain about my servants? And that teaches, teaches us a lesson for today. How dare we complain about a servant of God? I don't have anything else. I'm going to be quiet. Ken, this is Don Malor. Yes, Don. I, see, I see this passage as a great passage to encourage us with confidence. Uh, I think Amen. Some, sometimes people lack confidence to do things, uh, but this passage reminds us of confidence. Uh, I was the scriptures earlier that David showed up at the at the battle with the Philistines and the, <laughs> uh, the Israelites, and he had total confidence in God helping him with, with the lion and the bear, and he felt like he could definitely whip this giant. And, and we need to have that type of confidence also. It's something we can with a chapter like Romans 8. Yeah, the, this whole chapter just is one of uh, assurance over and over and over. We have the assurance. Um, God is there leading us and teaching us and protecting us. And if that won't give somebody assurance, I don't know what would. Thank you, Don. I think it also reinforces, Ken, that we, you know, to have this, uh, to be one of God's children, we have the obligation to live by the Spirit. Yeah. So we, it is one of confidence, but it's also one of obligation. Right. Now, we made the choice who we yeah. wanted to serve. And you can't back out on that choice. Right. Because the consequences are, are too grave, grave, plus being faithful, uh, it has such a richness of blessings that you could never begin to add them all up. You know, I think it's it's valuable for us to study this type of a chapter, this book 
uh, with some frequency. Um, it, it, it seems to me there are times people forget. We do get distracted with amazing things that happen in our lives, our electronic devices and TVs and, and, and events that take place. And we need this type of uh, uh, confidence, this type of assurance, and this type of admonition to walk in the spirit and to live by the spirit and that awareness that we are saved by the spirit. Right. I, I hate to say it, but I think we forget. I think we yeah. for, I think people in the church forget because they don't put a seriousness to connecting these dots. Right. We're, we're not finished with chapter eight, by the way. We only took the first 24 verses today. Next week, we'll do verses 25 and 26. But I, I agree with Don. I think, uh, you know, Romans 4 tells us to live a life worthy of the calling we've received. Mm -hmm. And I think at times we lose perspective on that calling, that blessing that, that we've received through Christ Jesus and through, mm -hmm. through the uh, being children of God. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I agree, Don. I don't know if they still do it anymore, but when I was in the military and and uh, we went into a, a country, a foreign country, we were reminded when we went out into the community that we were ambassadors of the United States of America. Right. Anytime anyone saw us, they would say, there is the United States. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it ought to be with us as Christians. Amen. Good point. Mm -hmm. Bill, what was that verse in Romans 4? Uh, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Okay. Yes, verse 1 of Ephesians. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians 5, 1, I remember it from the old King James Version. Uh, be uh, therefore followers of God as dear children. Children. <laughs> yep. But we, we've got a lot more good lessons left in Romans, so hang in there. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, to pray. Or, or Lynn. Lynn, would, would you like to lead us in a closing prayer, please? Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Father, it is a world-shaking thing for us to realize that we are your children chosen by you we make the choice to accept that adoption but we've been chosen by you in the beginning with that comes a great responsibility to be as ken mentioned ambassadors for you wherever we are with whomever we speak and have interaction with this responsibility is sometimes frightening to us, sometimes overwhelming to us, but we know that we can get through it because you're with us. We thank you for adopting us. We thank you for recognizing that we have that need for you mm -hmm. because you have created us to begin with. Amen. Continue to be with us as your church, with your church worldwide as it is in many cases undergoing severe troubles right now, not only in Ukraine, which is in the forefront of the news, but in many other countries, our brothers and sisters are hanging on and at times that they could not do without you. Yeah. Be with them, give them the strength, help them to feel your presence. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I, I have to say, uh, I was at, at a camp over the weekend, so I missed the Sunday services. Uh, 
Susan shared with me the bulletin and reading the article about the escape from Mariupol, that you go into Russia, travel around Ukraine, and enter another one of the countries uh, is an amazing, yeah. is an amazing oxymoron to, mm -hmm. to go into the foe to escape and get freedom. And um, it, 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 it just reminds us how, how amazing God is. And yet uh, Tim and others have, have gone over there to help with this, uh, lots of contacts. And uh, it, it was really, really encouraging to me. I shared it with others last night. Good. Amen. I'm sorry, but I missed um, Phil, all of the prayer requests. How is Kevin English? Uh, he is still in the hospital, as far as I know. Uh, you know, there, I, I, I think he's recovering. Uh, from from what I talked to Ray uh, uh, yesterday, and he said he's recovering, but still still weak, still not up to full strength at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he Thank had two two stents put in uh, after the uh, as a result of the heart attack he suffered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, yeah. 